Wilson, Mary Catherine Hamm, Brian Neiman, today's newsmakers, and you, the morning majority, 630. And those flash mob videos are amazing. You can check them out on our website. And we're going to talk about talk that, about next, that later, right. next hour. Um, I, how do you even stop them? And they're all, they're happening locally now. The, the pictures from the 7-Eleven in Montgomery County, Germantown. Yeah, in my, in my neck of the woods. How did this, how did this happen in my backyard? <laughs> it's scary. It's a terrible neighborhood, apparently. We got, <laughs> we got, <laughs> it was when I moved in. <laughs> Jake Tapper coming up about a half hour from now. Still in Iowa. We'll talk to him about how things are going there still. Larry Cutlow coming your way at 836. Joined now by Chris Chicola, president of the Club for Growth. Good morning, Chris. Good morning. So the president's in Iowa, too, right now. Um, he's on a bus tour. It's not a campaign or anything like that. He's just he's out there with the bus tour, just talking to the people. Here's what he said yesterday. I want to get your take on this. We know what to do. I'll be f- putting forward, when they come back in September, a very specific plan to boost the economy, to create jobs. I'm sure you're, you're waiting just on pins and needles to hear the president's plan about how he's going to get the economy and create jobs again. And, of course, why he has to wait till September and why he didn't do this in January, we all like to know the answer to that question as well. Well, that's exactly right. And you know, I think the, the reality is that this president in this White House has really no clue how you actually create jobs, wealth, and economic growth. You've got a bunch of academics that have never had a real job in, in the private sector and, and you know they haven't provided leadership on this issue uh, to date I doubt they will in the future um, and if they listen to people like Warren Buffett mm-hmm. I don't think they're going to come up with a plan that's going to actually um, result in economic growth and I, jobs I was going to ask you about that what do you make of Warren Buffett's article in his op-ed in the New York Times where he says that hey super rich people I guess people who make over a million dollars is what he considers super rich need to pay more in taxes because they're not paying they're actually paying less than what middle class people are paying as far as percentage of their income goes well, I, you know, before I got involved in politics, I had a real job. I was um, CEO of a, of a publicly traded company, and we sold that company to Warren Buffett, and he's the <laughs> owner today, and he's a good owner. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's a good business guy. He runs good businesses. And uh, But, you know, this argument that he makes, and this isn't the first time that he's made it, is, a, uh, I think, a disturbing argument, because he always talks about how his secretary pays more in taxes than he does as a percentage of income. Mm-hmm. So he is saying that investment income and wages, there is no different. He is saying that there's no reason to give people a uh, benefit for investing capital, creating jobs and economic growth, that everyone should be taxed the same. And so I think that it is a very uh, disingenuous argument. It doesn't recognize the uh, the reality of the world in which he lives in, that you have to give people the, uh, the incentive to risk capital. That's how you create jobs and economic growth. Uh, and, and maybe the worst part is it doesn't solve the problem. Uh, you could confiscate all the money, the top one-third of one percent or whatever he says, and you don't even start to solve our problem. All it does is start to uh, maybe address his rich guilt. But it's not a solution to our problem. It's, it's you know, populist poly- politics uh, that Barack Obama echoes on the campaign trail. It may work for, you know, some of his base, but it doesn't work to solve our problem. So if he wants to incorporate Warren Buffett's ideas on an economic plan, I don't think it's going to get us very far. Chris, I wonder what you think about this super committee that's coming up. There's a former Club for Growth president that's part of it, which makes me feel a little better about it. Pat Toomey is on the super committee to make these cuts. What's your thought on how that's going to go down? Well, I wish I knew. You know, there's Pat Toomey, there's uh, Jeb Henserling, who's also a Club for Growth uh, endorsed candidate when he uh, won in 2002, and John Kyle from Arizona. They are all Club for Growth uh, uh, bad candidates when they ran, and so it does give us some hope, but not a lot of confidence, uh, not because of them. It's because if history is any guy, these committees don't really come up with anything. But, the, you know, the difference is that they have severe consequences for not producing right. something. Um, Tom Coburn's theory is that, you know, the Senate will just get 60 votes to avoid the consequences, and, uh, you know, he may be right. Well, we, you know, I wish I had an idea of exactly how they're going to... Uh, um, know kind of get together and, and, and propose something I think it's going to be fascinating but you know the the reality is that the magnitude of the problem that we face is much bigger than our debt or deficit you know we have a 61 trillion dollar unfunded liability problem when you take into account things like Social Security Medicare Medicaid and one of the most uh, amazing statistics I've uh, come across lately is that you could confiscate the net worth of every single American and you still wouldn't solve our unfunded liability problems and our debt and our debt. Don't give them any ideas. <laughs> but that's, that's the magnitude <laughs> yeah, of the problem that these folks have to address. And if we don't start 
you know, if they don't come out with some real pro-growth fundamental tax reform, if they don't start to look at entitlements, uh, then this is just a waste of time. And getting, you know, seven votes to do that in a meaningful and responsible way would be an extraordinary accomplishment, but I'm not holding my breath. But, Chris, we don't need to worry. I mean, I, I, I understand that you have some concerns, but, I mean, it's all going to get better because we've now learned that the Obama administration is considering the possibility of developing, of implementing a Department of Jobs to tackle this problem. So we can all relax, can't we? Well, now I didn't realize that, so now that I've heard that, I feel much better. <laughs> well, it's all right, yeah. Um, that's all. That's all we need is another department. Is this a cabinet uh, position that uh, is being proposed? They're they're talking about merging several uh, entities and in, and in turning it into renaming. I guess the Department of Commerce, adding the trade rep and some State Department economic people, and turning it into the Department of Jobs. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe they'll uh, appoint the Republican nominee for president. That might be uh, <laughs> the only solution that we can hope for. Uh, speaking of which, uh, Rick Perry's name's been popped up a lot lately because people are trying to figure out who this guy is and what he's all about. The the Democrats go after him because the jobs that have been created in Texas, uh, they say aren't real jobs or they're not good jobs. They're just minimum wage jobs and they're oil jobs. They don't mean anything. Uh, I'd like to get your take on, on those criticisms of Rick Perry and the jobs that have been created in Texas. Well, when they're uh, criticizing a Republican uh, presidential candidate for creating jobs, um, you know, that's that's not bad. And so... <laughs> You know, the reality is Texas is a energy-producing state. Uh, the energy sector is very strong, but uh, it's an indication of maybe what uh, could help in, in states like Pennsylvania and New York and North Dakota. And we are an energy-producing com- country, and we have a lot of energy available that we don't produce. So, you know, if you have somebody that has an idea of what it takes to create jobs and economic growth and wealth, uh, that's a lot better than what we have now. So. If that's what they want to attack him on, is creating jobs but not the best jobs in the world, it's better than the jobs that are being created by the Obama administration, and that's a fight I think we can win. Yeah, because those jobs are sort of non-existent at this moment. That's right. <laughs> and the unemployment rate is highest in poor neighborhoods as well, so those are the people who need the jobs more than anybody else. Well, you know, I think the American people are pretty smart. Uh, they, they can see through all the clutter in the end. And they understand that we have a, a lot of challenges in the future. I served in the House for a couple of terms, and i got to tell you, the world has changed significantly for the better. Uh, you know, Congress is actually talking about how much less we spend rather than how much more we spend, which is, uh, you know, a good change of the discussion. Right. And, uh, um, and so, you know, I think that this is a cliché, but it's true that this is one of the most important elections that we'll face in our lifetime. It is a tipping point, uh, and I do have faith in the American people that they understand the problems that we have. Not all the details, but, they, uh, but they're paying attention and they want some solutions, and so hopefully we can find a candidate that will offer those. All right, Chris, thank you so much for joining. Good to have you on the Great. morning. Thank-